I want to invite you to turn in your Bibles with me to Mark, the second gospel in the New Testament, Mark chapter 11, as we read the story of the first Palm Sunday. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and just as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. And if anyone asks you, what are you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord needs it, and we'll send it back here shortly. They went and found a colt outside in the street, tied at a doorway. As they untied it, some people standing there asked, What are you doing, untying that colt? They answered as Jesus had told them to, and the people let them go. When they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, while others spread branches they had cut in the fields. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David! Hosanna in the highest heaven! Jesus entered Jerusalem and went into the temple courts. He looked around at everything, but since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. The word of God for the people of God. Holy, 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 holy,
Well, good morning, Mount Pleasant. It's good to be together virtually again this morning. I'm glad you're joining us here either on Facebook Live or on YouTube. Uh, if you would make a comment in the comment section on either of those places, that way we'll know you're here and we can, uh, 
we're kind of taking attendance that way a little bit. Thank you for being here and thanks for tuning in. This is Palm Sunday, as you've already gathered, and uh, this is the beginning of Holy Week. And uh, it'll be a different sort of Holy Week. We're used to gathering and worship, but we are going to gather virtually. And so Thursday night at 7 o'clock and Friday night at 7 o'clock uh, on both these locations, on Facebook and on YouTube, there'll be a, a shorter, a briefer service, but a time for us to remember those events and to share together in scripture reading and what they mean. So I invite you to join us those nights as well. Uh, gather your family around together and, and let's worship together as we walk through Holy Week um, in this strange time that we find ourselves in. Um, as I've reminded you every week, there are continuing to be uh, expenses and bills that have to be paid for the church. And so we appreciate those of you who have already and those of you who are yet going to sign up for online giving or find a way to, to make that happen. The web address for the online giving is at the bottom of your screen. It's bit.ly slash mtpgive. That'll get you to the Vanco page and you can sign up for online giving. There's also, uh, you can send a check in the mail. You can also use your bank's bill pay and that doesn't cost anybody anything on either end and they will send a check then to the church. So whatever way you choose to do it, let's continue to worship as we, as we think about our giving as we uh, give to God so that the work of His church might continue. Thank you. 
encourage you at this time if you have a notepad or a notebook you want to get out uh, take any notes anything God has to say to you we're praying that that is what happens in the midst of this worship service uh, there'll be scriptures and questions posted on the Facebook page later today that you can use throughout the week for you or for your life group I know a lot of life groups are starting to meet uh, again on zoom and, and using different platforms so I encourage you to do that uh, this morning I've been a Methodist all my life, uh, but in college and seminary, that was really the first time I got introduced to the, to the sermons of John Wesley and the songs of Charles Wesley. Now, most people know more of the songs of Charles than they do the sermons of John, and I'm that way too. I, I fell in love, though, with the way that Charles would take John's messages and put them into song, put them to music. I mean, it's hard for me to imagine Christmas without Hark the Herald Angels Sing or Easter without uh, Christ the Lord is risen today. In a lot of ways, the songs of Charles Wesley have really been the soundtrack of my faith these last many years. But there's one song I, I don't, he wrote I don't care for. I can't really get past it. One lyric he wrote in which I think he missed it by a long shot. The song is called Gentle Jesus, Meek and Mild. And, and I get that he wrote it for children to help them relate to Jesus. But to me, the imagery is all wrong. And I'm sure Charles worries about what I think a whole lot. But the Jesus I encounter in the Gospels is, is a lot of different things. But meek and mild, he is not. All throughout this very strange Lenten season, and I, I, I don't know about you, I have to remind myself that it's Lent, because this has been a very strange, very strange Lent. But all throughout this season, we've been looking at stories in the Gospels where Jesus seems to be behaving, be behaving badly. He isn't doing what, what those around him, or, or even those of us who, who read the story centuries later, he isn't doing what we think he ought to. This morning's story, though, because we read it every year on this day, on Palm Sunday, it, it, it's very familiar to most of us. And so it doesn't seem so out of the ordinary. I mean, just what exactly is Jesus doing here that's, that's so bad? Well, if you read the story closely, three things at least jump out at me that, uh, that are not ordinary. First of all, Jesus is involved in the theft of a donkey. He's impersonating a Messiah, so some people think. And he's creating a public disturbance when he rides into Jerusalem. And he's just getting started on this week of all weeks. This morning, so though, we're going we're gonna to look at this very familiar Palm Sunday story and try to look at it through first century eyes. Because when Jesus came riding down the side of the Mount of Olives, he was seen by many on that day as a revolutionary, not gentle Jesus, meek and mild. He was a revolutionary. And if that's the case, what kind of revolution is he bringing to Jerusalem on that day so long ago. So it's Passover time in Jerusalem. It's about the only time when the Roman governor would come and stay 
in Jerusalem. Most of the time, he preferred to stay in his posh palace out at Caesarea Maritima, which was on the, the shores of the Mediterranean Sea. But during Passover, at least, he would make the trip to Jerusalem to make sure these unruly Jews didn't get out of hand. Passover was one of those festivals that you were expected to attend in person, if at all possible. And so what was usually a fairly quiet little city would mushroom into this metropolis during Passover. And that many people together could cause a whole lot of trouble if they wanted to. Still, there was great anticipation among the people as they, as they traveled to Jerusalem. In, in 1995, before they built a big superhighway into the city, our bus took us on the route that many of the pilgrims would have taken when they came for Passover. And that route starts in Jericho. Jericho's in the desert. It's 800 feet below sea level. Jerusalem, which is only about a dozen miles away from Jericho, Jerusalem sits some 3,000 feet above sea level, and so it's a pretty steep incline. It's a hard trip to make. And yet I'll never forget when we were coming around that, that corner, that last corner, for the first time, and I caught my very first glimpse of Jerusalem, the, the holy city. For me, it's the place where so many events in the Gospels happened, and, and I couldn't wait to explore it. But for those in the first century, when they came around that corner, this is the city King David established as his capital. This is the place where, where Abraham encountered God on Mount Moriah. This is the place where the temple stood. This was the holiest spot on earth. This, if anywhere on earth, this is the place where God was said to dwell, Jerusalem. Once you made that turn toward the city, you'd forget all the weariness of climbing. It would just disappear. Passover was all about freedom. If you remember our study of Moses last fall, Passover was a remembrance of God setting the people free from slavery in Egypt. But it was more than just remembering. In the Passover celebration, the people believed that they became part of the group rescued from slavery. It wasn't just about mentally remembering that God had done something back then and there. It was all about knowing that God still sets captives free and that he would do so in the future. And that plays into why Passover made the Roman authorities so nervous. If there was ever a time during the year when somebody might get this bright idea to lead a rebellion and, and rise up against Rome, it's probably going to be during Passover. And so the Roman army is on high alert at this time, and I, I think that's, that's, that's why I think that Jesus' entry into Jerusalem is not as large as the movies tend to make it look. If there had been an abnormal number of people gathered around him, it's likely Rome would have cracked down on this, this parade. Jesus' entry into Jerusalem isn't really a public declaration. declaration. This is for his followers. And, and so he gets a colt of a donkey. And he rides it down the side of the Mount of Olives. That's a steep ride, I can tell you that. And he rides it into the temple courts. Now let's talk about what exactly is going on here. Beginning with Jesus' sweet ride. I mean, just like today. What you drove or what you rode in those days said something about you. I mean, you know every bit as much as I do that, that we tend to judge people at least a little bit by what they drive. We, we look at someone who's driving a Tesla different than we do someone who's driving a Toyota. In, in the ancient world, what you rode would communicate to the people what your intention was. For instance, when a conquering king would come into the city, if he was riding a white war horse, you knew that he was there to judge and destroy the city. A, a white horse was not good news for the, for the occupants of the city. If he came riding on a donkey's colt, that meant he was coming in peace. Now, the rabbis had taken that, and they'd said something very similar about the Messiah. They believed that when the Messiah came, if Israel was not ready, he would ride a colt. And if Israel was ready, he would ride a white horse. So does anybody remember what Revelation says Jesus will be riding when he returns? It says he'll be riding a white horse. But on this day, as he rides into Jerusalem, he rides a colt. He comes in peace, but he also knows Israel is not ready to receive him. That's part of why I think he stops halfway down the side of the mountain and he weeps over the city. Today, there is a small tear-shaped chapel at that location. It's one of my absolute favorite places in all the Holy Land. Because in that little chapel, you can look out past the altar and you see the city spread out before you. 
And I always get the same feeling when I stand in that place, the same feeling Jesus had. Why will you not listen? So they're, down, they're going down the side of this steep route down the mountain. And the group around Jesus is probably made up of, of other Passover pilgrims. Some probably knew who he was. Many may not have even been aware of his presence until the disciples bring him this donkey to ride on this colt of a donkey, little donkey. And at that point, Mark says, they create a makeshift saddle for him out of their cloaks. And people begin spreading cloaks and leafy branches on the road. Notice that Mark does not say, he, Mark doesn't say palm branches. Palm trees are not native to Jerusalem. Sometimes they, they can be transplanted there, but they don't grow there easily. It's John who mentions that they, they use at least some palm branches that day. And if that's the case, they probably carried them all the way from Jericho because the palm branch grew there and it was a symbol of freedom. And so these branches that were meant for use in celebration over Passover are now being used to declare who they believe Jesus to be. He's the freedom bringer. This is, this is radically extravagant. I mean, he, he, in the dusty, dirty Middle East, you don't throw your cloak on the ground for somebody to, be, to walk on it. That, that may be the only cloak you have. And you don't cut off branches from a tree that probably was planted there to provide shade from the hot sun. You don't do those things unless you're welcoming royalty. What's happening there on the side of the Mount of, Mount of Olives is not just a happy little parade. This is a, this is a proclamation. From at least a small crowd, this, this man on the donkey, they, they're telling people, is some kind of king. And these people believe he's coming to claim his kingdom. And he's coming to give them freedom. I mean, that's what the singing is all about. Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father, of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. That's a, Hosanna is a common Passover greeting. It, it's sort of like saying, uh, hey there, haven't seen you since last year. Literally, it means save now, but it also come to mean uh, praise God. And so when they cry out Hosanna, it's sort of like they're saying praise God. And by the way, God, aren't you going to do something to save us right now? The beginning and the end of their song is from Psalm 118. But in the middle of their song, musicians would call this the bridge. In the middle of their song, there is this dangerous prayer. It says, blessed is the coming kingdom of our father, David. And they're singing this around Jesus, entering the city like he's a conquering king who's come to bring peace, riding a colt. They're singing as he enters a city under occupation by another power, by a city presided over by a governor appointed by Rome. They're singing this as that governor is on edge, worried that a revolution might break out during the Passover festivities. These are the seeds of revolution. And it is, in fact, a revolution that Jesus has in mind, but his revolution and the one the people want are not the same thing because Jesus is not the kind of king the people are hoping for. Messiah, or the Greek version of that word is Christ, Messiah is a royal title. Everybody expected that the Messiah would be king. He'd be an earthly king, someone who would rule from Jerusalem and, and who would conquer the world. In the first century especially, expectation was high that that such a king would come and he would kick out the Romans and he would set up Israel as a sovereign, independent nation once again. There, there was this constant longing for a return to the days of King David, their greatest king, the time when, when, when Israel was at its height. And so you remember Jesus took his disciples on a retreat once. He took them to a place far, far, far north called Caesarea Philippi. It's a fascinating place. Still today, it's a, it's a fascinating place because you can walk among the ruins of all these pagan temples if you wanted a religious place in the first century Caesarea Philippi was it It was sort of a <clears throat> sort of a shopping mall for religion there were temple after temple after temple lined up you could just choose whichever god you wanted just choose and then you could go to that god's temple probably there was a temple there and it was in that place with the backdrop of all these religious choices where Jesus had asked his followers two questions. First of all, who do people say that I am? That was just a warm-up question. That answer really didn't matter. Because the main question he wanted to ask was a second one. Who do you say I am? Who do you say I am? And Peter, who's usually the spokesman for the group, he says, you're the Messiah. You're the Christ. You're the King. 
Now, I don't know what Peter expected Jesus to do at that moment, but I'm pretty certain it wasn't what he actually did. Mark says, Jesus warned them not to tell anybody about him. Why? Why not? I mean, Peter got the answer right for a change. <laughs> Wouldn't Jesus want a testimonial? Wouldn't he want someone to, to tell them, tell others who he is? Somebody to endorse him? I mean, political candidates today pay big bucks to get people to endorse them. Why doesn't Jesus want that? Well, far be it for me to guess the mind of the Son of God, but most scholars have con concluded that Jesus wanted to be the Messiah on his own terms. He knows he's not going to be the kind of king the people want or they think they want the kind they think they need, the kind of king that they're looking for. That's not the kind of revolution he came to bring. If Peter goes around saying, hey, here's the Messiah, people are going to expect the wrong things from Jesus. And so instead, he lets, Jesus lets his actions speak for him because he's not the warrior king. He's a suffering servant. And as a servant, he didn't come to conquer and to kill. He came to, well, he came to serve. He's going to demonstrate that on Thursday night by washing feet. But even before that, Jesus is constantly serving others. And in that service, he's telling us about his kingdom. You know, he does these miracles. And there's basically four kinds of miracles that Jesus does. It's all part of his larger mission. The ones we think of most often are the healings, when Jesus gets rid of a person's disease or, or a weakness. And the healings are all about restoring the brokenness of humanity. The places where our sin and our fallenness have impacted our lives. I've said it before, but I'm going to keep saying it until I can't anymore. You know, God doesn't cause cancer. God doesn't sit up in heaven and see you down there and decide to zap you with a serious illness. God didn't send this coronavirus. To our special needs folks, let me say this too. God is not punishing you or someone else in any way with your challenges. That's not the God of the Bible. All those things uh, and, and more are, are evidence of a fallen world. It's not the way God ever intended the world to be. And so Jesus heals people then and still today as evidence that he wants to bring the world back the way it was intended to be from the very beginning. I don't have, I don't have an answer as to why everyone is not healed in this life. Even when we pray and we ask for healing, I mean, I'm, I'm living proof of that. For some reason, God doesn't choose to supernaturally heal everyone. I wasn't healed except through the hands of a skilled surgeon that I believe God gave that ability to, but still. But that puts me at risk in this strange time that we're in now. But this I do know. One day, when I'm with Jesus, I will be made whole. And I'll be given a new body without limitations. And I'll be remade the way God intended me to be. That's the good news of these healings that Jesus does. They're just a foretaste of the promise that all who believe are given. He came to make us whole. And he came to make creation whole. That's the message of the nature miracles. When Jesus walks on water, when he calms the sea, when he turns water into wine, Jesus is reclaiming fallen creation. Paul described it this way. He says, the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the, of, the, of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. I mean, creation itself knows that this is not the way it's supposed to be. And when Jesus does nature miracles, he's restoring fallen creation. One day when the king returns and establishes his kingdom forever, this is what's promised for creation. The wolf will live with the lamb, the leopard will lie down with the goat, the calf and the lion and the yearling together, and a little child shall lead them. Creation in perfect harmony because the king is on the throne. The king is in the room. And then there are the exorcisms. The times when Jesus casts out demons from people and from, and from animals. Remember the pigs that ran down the hill? Even a storm at sea, when, when the boat that the disciples are, are in is threatened, it's described by the gospel writer as a, as a demonic storm. It's, a, it's, a, it's an attempt to, early on to do away with Jesus and his followers. But you know, no matter what power Satan uses, Jesus' power is greater. Evil will not stand. Demonic forces will not win. You know, some say 
even some pastors say that in today's world, we're just, we're just too smart. We're too grown up. We're too sophisticated to believe in, in demons. And I, and I don't know about any sort of being with horns and a pitchfork and red pajamas. But I do know this. Evil is real. And it's rampant. Children being abused is evil. People being sold into slavery to satisfy the pleasures of buyers is evil. People being beheaded because of their religious faith is evil. People flying planes into buildings or terrorizing others just because they disagree is evil. Demons today may not be so obvious. They may wear respectable clothes like policy and procedure and, and even a free election. But evil is still real. And I, and I say all that not to scare you or to have you looking around every corner for a demon. When I was at, at Asbury, I, I worked in the Ichthus Music Festival one year as an, as an altar counselor. And I still remember in the training they would tell us, you don't let the youth pastors in. Because they're always trying to cast out demons out of their youth. And, and I was a youth pastor once. I get that. But not every bad act is because of a demon. They don't look around every corner. And here, here's the main point of the exorcisms in the Gospels. Jesus is greater and he's more powerful than any evil. He proved it over and over and over again. And then the final type of miracle Jesus does is resuscitating the dead. Now, I got to say, this... I don't think this kind of miracle was appreciated by the recipient. I mean, I mean, think about Lazarus. By the time Jesus got there to raise him back from life, back to life, he'd been dead for four days. He'd been in the kingdom in eternity. He'd been enjoying the presence of God for four days. And Jesus called him back here. You see what I mean? When I die, don't be calling anybody over to raise the dead. I plan to stay with Jesus. Worst of all, Lazarus had to die again. I mean, he probably thought, whew, I got that out of the way, but he had to do it again. Not to mention that John tells us people were trying to kill him to get rid of the evidence that Jesus had power over death. I'm not sure Jesus did him any favors. But all that aside, Jesus shows us that in his kingdom, death is not an issue. It's not a thing. It's not a big deal. In fact, in the very last book of the Bible, we get a picture of what life in the kingdom is like. And it's a passage I read at almost every funeral I do because it, it's honestly, it's just, so beautiful and the, and the promise is so powerful in the kingdom listen to this he will wipe every tear from their eyes there will be no more death no more mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away jesus kingship extends even over death jesus is a king and he's a revolutionary but he did not come to be king over jerusalem and he did not come to start a violent revolution he came to restore what is broken and to bring humanity, you and me, back to God. When he rides into Jerusalem on that first Palm Sunday, Jesus comes as a king, but not as one who's going to rule from an earthly throne. In fact, his throne will be a cross. And what he does on that cross will show us that he is here to defeat humanity's ultimate foes, disease, death, sin, and Satan. He's here to reverse the results of the fall and to bring restoration to a fallen world. Maybe we could sum up re Jesus' revolution the way Paul did. Paul said this, Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, It is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, and here's the revolution part, on the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. The revolution Jesus brought is a revolution of love, of good, of, of healing the world. And he calls us to participate in that same revolution. I mean, if we like the crowd on the hill at the first Palm Sunday, if we want to proclaim him as the coming king, what better way to do that than, by, than to overcome evil with good? Rather than waving palm branches, we proclaim him to be king by starting our own revolution of love right where we live. Start with your neighbors. I, I know right now we're doing the whole social distancing thing, but that doesn't stop us from, from calling or FaceTiming or Skyping to check on people, to offer to pray with them. I know people who make sure they take a walk about the same time in their neighborhood every day and they run into the same people and over time as they build up that relationship they ask them simply is there is there anything i can pray for you about 
Very few people refuse an offer for prayer, and it's, it's a simple way to overcome evil with good. We're collecting cards and notes to deliver to, deliver to our shut-ins during this time when, when those who are most isolated, the loneliness might be most prevalent in the, in the nursing homes. And so our shut-ins are used to having weekly visits from our care team, and now nobody can come in. But you can send a card, and you can write a note, and you can say a prayer, and you can drop those off at at the mailbox in front of the church office or get them to Sherry Swan. Overcome the evil of this pandemic with some good. I I know you can can probably come up with other ways in this time of shelter in place to bring the light of Jesus and the love of God into your neighborhoods. Why don't you share some of those ideas that you've had on our Facebook page so that others can get their creativity sparked. Simple, kind actions will proclaim what kind of king this Jesus is to our community. This summer, when we're hopefully all all past this, <laughs> you're going you're gonna to have a, a concentrated time to proclaim Jesus as a king who overcomes evil with good. A couple years ago, some of you remember, we did what we called an 812 mission trip where we, we tried to make a difference for the kingdom of Jesus right here in our own city, in our own neighborhoods. And we're going to bring that opportunity back this summer in July in the neighborhood, particularly around Friendship House. Now, the folks who live there at Friendship House, I call them our advanced scouts. They've been building relationships with their neighbors all year since we opened Friendship House back in August. And now we get a chance to come in and do projects and impact that neighborhood that we have made a long-term commitment to. And I want to invite you to participate, to, to, to come alongside and to share the light of Christ in that neighborhood. We may not be able to transform the whole city all at once, but we can overcome evil with good in, in a neighborhood here and a neighborhood there and a, and a neighborhood at a time, begin to change our community. So details are going to be rolling out soon, but I want, to, I want you to pray about it, to think about it. Consider taking some time off that week and putting some energy toward overcoming evil with good. I mean, all your home projects are probably done by now, right? So why not give some time to someone else? Whether or not you participate in that week, this is our calling every day because it's the mission of the king. And if he's our king, he sets a standard for the way we live. He came to love. He came to forgive. And he rode into Jerusalem on that first Palm Sunday to start the revolution the world needed not the one we thought we wanted but the one we need it's a revolution that hasn't stopped yet he's not gentle jesus meek and mild he is a king who's determined to overcome evil with good do that live that way and the world will see jesus in you let's pray god we give you thanks on this palm sunday for the opportunity to to worship even distant to worship together And on this Palm Sunday, we remember the revolution Jesus came to bring, that he came to overcome evil with good. And so I pray that you would challenge us and help us to do that. As we head into this Holy Week, help us to see ways, find ways in which we can be the light of Christ in our neighborhoods and our communities, even as we're staying at home, that we can make a difference even now. And God, we do pray for this virus to be eradicated. We pray for the doctors and nurses who are on the front lines healthcare workers, first responders, all those who are making a difference, especially for those who are involved in the research for a cure. We pray, God, that your hand would work in leading and guiding them. We pray for those who are sick today, for those who are hurting, for those who need a touch of your grace and your mercy. God, in your mercy, hear our prayers from our hearts to your throne for those we know who are sick, for those who are struggling, for those who are lonely. Hear our prayers. God, we pray for our church, for our bishop, Julius Trimble, for our superintendent, John Groves, for the leadership of our church as we continue to move forward in these uncertain days, you would help us to make wise decisions. God, we pray for our brothers and sisters and churches throughout the community. We look forward to the day when we're able to physically be together again. But until then, keep us safe. Keep us focused on your, your task, your goal, your calling for our lives. And we will give you the thanks and the praise in Christ's most precious name. And all God's people said, amen.
Friends, may you be blessed this week and remember that the God who spoke still speaks to us. The God who came still comes to us, wherever you are. May you be blessed and may you go in peace. Amen.
I almost said live long and prosper. I don't know where that came from. Live long and prosper. That'll be on the outtakes roll. Some.